The Haramic Legend. When Solomon the Beloved of God, Builder of the Everlasting House, and Grand Master of the Lodge of Jerusalem, ascended the throne of his father David. He consecrated his life to the erection of a temple to God, and a palace for the kings of Israel. David's faithful friend, Hiram, king of Tyre, hearing that a son of David sat upon the throne of Israel, sent messages of congratulation and offers of assistance to the new ruler. In his History of the Jews, Josephus mentions that copies of the letters passing between the two kings were then to be seen both at Jerusalem, and at Tyre. Despite Hiram's lack of appreciation for the twenty cities of Galilee, which Solomon presented to him upon the completion of the temple, the two monarchs remained the best of friends. Both were famous for their wit and wisdom, and when they exchanged letters each devised puzzling questions to test the mental ingenuity of the other. Solomon made an agreement with Hiram of Tyre promising vast amounts of barley, wheat, corn, wine, and oil, as wages for the masons and carpenters from Tyre who were to assist the Jews in the erection of the temple. Hiram also supplied cedars and other fine trees, which were made into rafts and floated down the sea to Joppa, whence they were taken inland by Solomon's workmen to the temple site. Because of his great love for Solomon, Hiram of Tyre sent also the grand master of the Dionysiac architects, Hiram Abif, a widow's son, who had no equal among the craftsmen of the earth. Hiram is described as being a Tyrian by birth, but of Israelitish descent, and a second Bezaleel, honored by his king with the title of father. The Freemason's Pocket Companion, published in 1771, describes Hiram as, the most cunning, skillful and curious workman that ever lived, whose abilities were not confined to building alone, but extended to all kinds of work, whether in gold, silver, brass or iron, whether in linen, tapestry, or embroidery, whether considered as an architect, statuary, founder or designer, separately or together, he equally excelled. From his designs, and under his direction, all the rich and splendid furniture of the temple, and its several appendages were begun, carried on, and finished. Solomon appointed him, in his absence, to fill the chair, as deputy grandmaster. And in his presence, senior grand warden, master of work, and general overseer of all artists, as well those whom David had formerly procured from Tyre and Sidon, as those Hiram should now send. Modern Masonic writers differ as to the accuracy of the last sentence. Although an immense amount of labor was involved in its construction, Solomon's Temple, in the words of George Oliver, was only a small building and very inferior in point of size to some of our churches. The number of buildings contiguous to it and the vast treasure of gold and precious stones used in its construction concentrated a great amount of wealth within the temple area. In the midst of the temple stood the Holy of Holies, sometimes called the Oracle. It was an exact cube, each dimension being twenty cubits, and exemplified the influence of Egyptian symbolism. The buildings of the temple group were ornamented with 1,453 columns of Parian marble, magnificently sculptured, and 2,906 pilasters decorated with capitals. There was a broad porch facing the east, and the Sanctum Sanctorum was upon the west. According to tradition, the various buildings and courtyards could hold in all 300,000 persons. Both the sanctuary and the Holy of Holies were entirely lined with solid gold plates encrusted with jewels. King Solomon began the building of the temple in the fourth year of his reign on what would be, according to modern calculation, the 21st day of April, and finished it in the eleventh year of his reign on the 23rd day of October. The temple was begun in the 480th year after the children of Israel had passed the Red Sea. Part of the labor of construction included the building of an artificial foundation on the brow of Mount Moriah. The stones for the temple were hoisted from quarries directly beneath Mount Moriah and were trued before being brought to the surface. The brass and golden ornaments for the temple were cast in molds in the clay ground between Succoth and Zaradatha, and the wooden parts were all finished before they reached the temple site. The building was put together, consequently, without sound and without instruments, all its parts fitting exactly, without the hammer of contention, the axe of division, or any tool of mischief. Anderson's much-discussed Constitutions of the Freemasons, published in London in 1723, and reprinted by Benjamin Franklin in Philadelphia in 1734, thus describes the division of the laborers engaged in the building of the everlasting house. But Dagon's temple, and the finest structures of Tyre and Sidon, could not be compared with the eternal God's temple at Jerusalem, 
there were employed about it no less than 3,600 princes, or master masons, to conduct the work according to Solomon's directions, with 80,000 hewers of stone in the mountain, or fellow craftsmen, and 70,000 laborers, in all 153. 600 besides the levy under Adoniram to work in the mountains of Lebanon by turns with the Sidonians, 30,000, being in all 183,600. Daniel Sickles gives 3,300 overseers, instead of 3,600, and lists the three grand masters separately. The same author estimates the cost of the temple at nearly 4,000 millions of dollars. The Masonic legend of the building of Solomon's temple does not in every particular parallel the scriptural version especially in those portions relating to Hiram Aviv. According to the biblical account, this master workman returned to his own country, in the Masonic allegory he is foully murdered. On this point A. E. Wait, in his new Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, makes the following explanatory comment. The legend of the master builder is the great allegory of masonry. It happens that his figurative story is grounded on the fact of a personality mentioned in Holy Scripture, but this historical background is of the accidents and not the essence. The significance is in the allegory and not in any point of history which may lie behind it. Hiram, as master of the builders, divided his workmen into three groups, which were termed entered apprentices, fellow craftsmen, and master masons. To each division he gave certain passwords and signs by which their respective excellence could be quickly determined. While all were classified according to their merits some were dissatisfied for they desired a more exalted position than they were capable of filling. At last three fellow craftsmen, more daring than their companions, determined to force Hiram to reveal to them the password of the master's degree. Knowing that Hiram always went into the unfinished sanctum sanctorum at high noon to pray, these ruffians whose names were, Jubela, Jubilo, and Jubilum, lay in wait. For him, one at each of the main gates of the temple. Hiram, about to leave the temple by the south gate, was suddenly confronted by Jubela armed with a 24-inch gauge. Upon Hiram's refusal to reveal the master's word, the ruffian struck him on the throat with the rule, and the wounded master then hastened to the west gate, where Jubilo, armed with a square, awaited him and made a similar demand. Again Hiram was silent, and the second assassin struck him on the breast with the square. Hiram thereupon staggered to the east gate, only to be met there by Jubilum armed with a maul. When Hiram, refused him the master's word, Jubilum struck the master between the eyes with the mallet and Hiram fell dead. The body of Hiram was buried by the murderers over the brow of Mount Moriah and a sprig of acacia placed upon the grave. The murderers then sought to escape punishment for their crime by embarking for Ethiopia, but the port was closed. All three were finally captured, and after admitting their guilt were duly executed. Parties of three were then sent out by King Solomon and one of these groups discovered the newly made grave marked by the evergreen sprig. After the entered apprentices and the fellow craftsmen had failed to resurrect their master from the dead he was finally raised by the master mason with the strong grip of a lion's paw. To the initiated builder the name Hiram Abif signifies my father, the universal spirit, one in essence, three in aspect. Thus the murdered master is a type of the cosmic martyr, the crucified spirit of good, the dying God whose mystery is celebrated throughout the world. Among the manuscripts of Dr. Sigismund Bastrom, the initiated Rosicrucian, appears the following extract from von Welling concerning the true philosophic nature of the Masonic Hiram. The original word, Hiram, is a radical word consisting of three consonants, Shith, Resh, and Mem. One, Shith, signifies Chama, the sun's light, I, E, the universal, invisible, cold fire of nature attracted by the sun, manifested into light and sent down to us and to every planetary body belonging to the solar system. 2. Resh, signifies Ruach, I, E, spirit, air, wind, as being the vehicle which conveys and collects the light into numberless foci, wherein the solar rays of light are agitated by a circular motion and manifested in heat and burning fire. 3. Mem, signifies Majim, water, humidity, but rather the mother of water, i, e, radical humidity or a particular kind of condensed air. These three constitute the universal agent or fire of nature in one word, Chiram, not Hiram. Excerpt from The Secret Teachings of All Ages, Illustrated, Manly P. Hall.